So this morning we're going to be talking about the uh, spectroscopy basics and really focusing on the Fourier transform infrared instrumentation. And then the next lecture on Monday will be on the Raman spectrometer. So next week we're actually going to get into the lab and collect data and we're going to analyze real vibrational spectra, not just the particle in a box, theoretical things. So we're making a shift now. We've done theory for about a third of the course. And, and so then we'll do application for about two-thirds of the course. And this is a, a nice departure. When I took physical chemistry, it was mostly a math course. It was theory most, pretty much the whole semester. And so I wanted to teach it a little differently. A lot of our students go into industry, they're going to have their hands on the instruments, and I wanted them to actually get some practical application in PCHEM and teach it a little differently than what I had. So for spectroscopy basics, let's go over just the, the general items related to infrared spectroscopy. I'm going to show you today about where, where infrared lies in the electromagnetic, electromagnetic spectrum and the different types of instruments. We have dispersive instruments and Fourier transform instruments. And so today we're going to learn what's going on with the Fourier transform part. So what does that mean? And this will be very useful for you in instrumental when you're talking about the difference between dispersive instruments and, and FT instruments. There are two main instruments that are Fourier transform. There's the Fourier transform infrared spectrometer, and then your pulsed NMR spectrometers are also Fourier transform instruments. And we'll talk about that as well. And then the different types of vibrational transitions. We've covered this pretty extensively. But we'll just do a bit of a review showing what kind of transitions are happening in terms of absorbance and emission. And emission is the same as absorbance, except the arrows are going down instead of up in the energy level diagram. So here's the electromagnetic spectrum. You've seen this before, I'm sure. And it's uh, going from gamma rays on the left all the way to radio waves on the right. Gamma rays, waves are extremely short. So we're talking about 10 to the minus 14 meters. Get your mind around that. You know, One over 10 with 14 zeros, or one with 14 zeros. That's how small the wavelength is in gamma rays. Whereas radio waves, we're talking about 10 to the 8 meters. <laughs> And so if, you, if you're a submarine buff, you like the, the Tom Clancy books back in the day about submarines, and they, they, they drag out this cable called the extremely long, low frequency array. They, they would drag this cable out behind the submarine that was maybe not 10 to the 8 meters long, but long, okay, like a mile long cable, and interact with radio waves so we could communicate with our submarines using extremely low frequency radiation. And so that's just using it for communication. You could also do spectroscopy with radio waves. Do you know the technique that uses radio waves for spectroscopy? NMR. And so NMR, when you talk about 300 megahertz, 300 megahertz is in the radio frequency range. Even though we're talking about a nuclear process, the protons in the nucleus are carbon-13 or deuterium and so on, you have uh, the magnetic moment in those nuclei and there's really no difference without an external field in the energies. But if you put those, those nuclear spins in a magnetic field, you can get a split in their energy levels. And that split is related to the magnetic field strength. So if you put them in a stronger magnetic field, the split gets larger. And then a Boltzmann distribution gives you a differential population in those energy levels. And so then you can do spectroscopy with it. But even with our strongest magnets, we can barely get get to the high part of the radio frequency range. Uh, it was really neat at, at the University of Texas. We had the student radio station, uh, KUT was at 100 megahertz, and we had a 100 megahertz proton NMR. <laughs> okay. And so the, the, uh, the uh, professor doing this demonstration had the probe signal teed out and went over to uh, the antenna on his radio. So we're listening to the student radio station, and it's playing the normal um, stuff that they played. It was pretty kind of a crummy radio station when I was there. But anyway, they're playing some kind of crazy punk rock or something. I don't know. And it's going on and, and it's annoying everybody in the lab. And then he would pulse the protons and the signal from the protons spinning in the NMR would be played on the radio. And it's very cool. Yeah, so, so I know we're getting off the topic from infrared and into NMR, but we really don't have much about NMR in the course. So what is going on is proton resonance, and it depends on the magnetic field. And if the magnetic field is not perfect, then the resonance dies off really quickly. 
and it sounded like you kind of hit a wrench with a, with a screwdriver. It's like, plink, okay? And so then he would shim the magnets and straighten that field a little bit electronically, and he'd pulse it again, and he'd go, punk, a little different, okay? And then he'd shim it a little bit more, and it sounded like you hit a tuning fork. Bing! And you're hearing those protons resonate in that magnetic field. And we're listening to it on the radio. That was really cool, okay? <laughs> the point was that was in the radio frequency range. Okay, so then we move over to microwaves, uh, terahertz range as well. That's what the terahertz scanner is at the airport. And so that's uh, 10 to the 12 hertz, terahertz. And then microwaves, like your microwave oven, that's tuned to the rotational levels in water. So it heats water that's in your food. And then we get to the infrared region, which is what we're gonna be studying this next week. So there's three ranges in the infrared, the near infrared, which means it's near the visible range. So it's higher frequency infrared. The mid-infrared is the typical, when you say infrared spectroscopy, you're probably talking about the mid-infrared. And that range is 400 to 4,000 wave numbers. These limits aren't hard and fast. It's not like something dramatic happens at 400 wave numbers that tells you you're in a different range. And so sometimes you'll see it even in these notes, 200 to 400, sometimes 100 to 400. But it's just that middle range, or 100 to 4,000, uh, that middle range of the infrared. That's where the fingerprint region of most molecules are. That's the bending modes for molecules and then the stretching modes of the light atoms like hydrogen. So carbon, hydrogen, and nitrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen. Hydrogen stretching is in around the 3,000 wave number range. So that's, that's the bonding in a molecule. So if you want to know what kind of polymer this is, what kind of uh, liquid or substance, you're going to look at the bonding in that molecule and you're going to be able to identify it. <clears throat> then we have the far infrared, that's, that's uh, the very, very low frequency modes. That would be the bending of the whole molecule. So it's like a plank of wood bending. You know, it doesn't really tell you much about the properties of the molecule. It tells you about the properties of the molecule in aggregate. Then we get into the uh, visible range, and that's typically 400 to 700 nanometers. And we call it the visible range because it's based on our eye. That's what we can see. So our eye will respond to 400 nanometer light, which is deep blue, up to 700 nanometer light, which is red. And then you've got Roy G. Biv in between. Okay, so red, orange, yellow, blue, indigo, violet. So blue, bluer, and then really, really blue. <laughs> okay. Then we get to the X or UV, and there's uh, there's a division line, that might, like UVA and UVB, that's not really a spectroscopic term, it's related to whether it ionizes water or not. And so, if, you're, if the UV light will ionize water, then we call that ionizing radiation. That's about 190 nanometers, it's the cutoff for water. And so that's really damaging to the body, because if sunlight hits your skin and ionizes the water, then it creates free radicals, and then those free radicals can react in your cells. Most of the time, they kill the cells. And so then you have dead tissue that needs to be dealt with. Your body deals with tissue by swelling and, and pumping blood to that area and just deconstructing those dead cells, metabolizing them, and eliminating them. And so a deep tissue burn, a sunburn, is essentially like a, like a physical burn, like if you burned your hand on something. You've killed those cells, and they now need to be processed. Your body can do this. It does this all the time. So uh, it's whether you overwhelm the, the speed at which your body can do this. If you overwhelm your body, like if you get a deep tissue burn, say in the x-rays or the gamma rays, uh, your body has to just deal with that dead tissue. And so that would be what we call radiation sickness. And so once you get above the ionization level of water, then you're dealing with ionization radiation or ionizable radiation. And so that's what we call, you know, the scare quote, radiation but all of it's radiation. It's all electromagnetic radiation. The real cutoff is whether it can ionize water or not. So then we have x-rays. X-rays deal, well, okay, let's go back to visible. Visible deals with the electrons. So the motions of the electrons in the molecule. <clears throat> and then you get to UV rays and you can start ejecting electrons from a molecule. So you can ionize molecules in the UV. And you're typically ionizing the valence band. So visible and UV are dealing with valence electrons. But then when you get into the 
vacuum UV and the X-ray, you start getting into the core electrons. So X-ray <coughs> photoelectron spectroscopy is knocking core electrons out of the substance. And that's really helpful to, for determining what kind of atom you have, especially the 1s electrons. Because if you think about the periodic table, every element is identified by its uh, number of protons. And the number of protons dramatically affect the 1s electrons. So you have two electrons in every atom that are in the 1s shell. And if you can pull those out and record the energy it took to pull those electrons out, then you know what element you're dealing with. And so Mosley was the one that discovered that. And so he has a nice linear plot of all the nuclei that he had studied. And you can find gaps and know where there were gaps in the periodic table at the time. Because they hadn't discovered an element in the substance that had a 1s ionization energy in this spot right here. So that's how they filled out the periodic table, was using the x-rays. Then we get into gamma rays, and you're dealing with nuclear transitions. So you can make nuclei stable by uh, or unstable by irradiating them with gamma rays, and then they may, it may cause them to break apart if they're heavy enough. And so you can have stimulated fission if you hit it with gamma rays. So that's the electromagnetic spectrum. Here it is in table format with numbers put into those various boundaries. But I put, you put here um, this table in the notes mainly so you can see over here the sources so for gamma rays, of course, for those, we need radioactive elements. We need elements that are giving off gamma rays to use them in spectroscopy. For X-rays, we have cathode ray tubes. And so we can set up a voltage to where electrons start streaming from the negative, uh, um, from the, from the negative pole to the cathode and hitting that cathode, that positively charged cathode. And if that cathode is made out of, say, copper, it'll give off a certain uh, type of x-ray, if it's made out of aluminum or what have you. So we can make the cathode out of different materials and then we can blast it with electrons and create x-rays. We have the, the deuterium lamp for the UV, which is essentially heavy hydrogen and it's a gas discharge. We run electricity through a gas and we get the, the emission spectrum from that gas. And it gives off a lot of UV light, just like our mercury lights here give off visible light. So we have gas discharge tubes in this room giving us light for the room. We also have the tungsten halogen lamp in the visible. So that's just a hot wire. The halogen part isn't really participating in the light emission. So you're not getting the emission spectrum of chlorine. Chlorine is a typical gas that they put in there. It just makes the, the filament hotter and keeps it from breaking. So you have a hot tungsten wire that you're running electricity through, and it's black body radiation. It's going to get hot, and it's going to emit all wavelengths of light. The brighter you, you want it to be brighter, you need it to get hotter. But when you heat up a metal, some of those, those uh, metal atoms can boil off the surface. And so this metal will sublime, and it will, the metal will come off of the surface of that wire and actually create a mirrored image on the, on the glass and then that reduces your light output. So if you put a, a halogen gas in there, a non-reactive gas with that metal, then it will keep the metal ions by giving it pressure, keep the metal ions onto the, the metal wire. And so you have a really hot bulb though. And that's why I remember the old halogen lamps. Do y'all remember those that, that, that would cook bugs, especially the Springer moths that would come through every once in a while? They fly around and they land up in that thing and then that, that bulb is hot enough to cook off the protein and it makes an awful smell. And it my, triggered my gag reflex. I would always be like, <laughs> and Jennifer's like, it's not that bad. Like, oh yeah, it is, it's terrible. <laughs> so that's a halogen lamp in that, that, uh, that room light. And then in the infrared, infrared energy is what we call heat. And so it's still black body radiation, but not as high a temperature. And so they make these very stable ceramic uh, heating elements. It's like a resistor that you heat up and it gives off a nice, clean spectrum in the infrared. So that's what we call a hot ceramic glow bar or a nursed glower. And then down here in the uh, terahertz, we have semiconductor oscillators and same in the, in the radio waves. So the terahertz scanners at the airport, the ones where you, you stand in front of them like this, and then you zoom by, uh, they're really not taking a spectrum of your body. Terahertz is reflected by water. 
And so wherever there's water, if it's going to, it's going to bounce off of water. It's not going to bounce off of cotton fabric or anything like that. And so they're basically using your body's water as a hard surface to bounce the terahertz off of. And so they can see through your clothes. If something is, is dense, then it'll appear dark. So if you have, you know, a plastic, um, let's say you're trying to, you've got a 3D printed gun, right? And it's plastic. You get through the, radi the metal detector, but you're in the terahertz scanner and you've got a dense plastic in your pocket. They're going to see that outline, okay? And you're not going to get on the plane. <laughs> so they're just swinging that, that thing by, and it's fast too. You see, they, they blast you with terahertz and then the detector sweeps by, and it's just taking a slice at both angles on either side. These are just a review of the equations. You have these equations in your notes, um, but I wanted to also point out these here. These are from NIST, and these are the constants with all of their significant figures. So in your lab, when you're doing analyses, use all of these. Here's Avogadro's number, you know it's 6.022, but did you know all the other digits? It's 6.022.1367. So we know all of those digits. Uh, Planck's constant, 6.660755, or the speed of light, 299792458. Okay, and I've got that one memorized because it was a cheat code on one of my games. You can build a lot faster if you typed in the speed of light. <laughs> okay, so it's a nice way to commit things to memory. Uh, here's Boltzmann's constant, not as well known, and, and so on. Now let's talk about the construction of instruments. This is a dispersive spectrometer. And dispersive spectrometers use gratings or prisms to disperse light. Uh, for visible spectroscopy, it's easy to use a glass prism. I mean, you, you know, you can, you can buy what you would typically think of as a nice you know, right angle glass prism and you send the light through. At, a, at an angle, and, and it disperses the light, gives you a rainbow. And then you send that rainbow of light through the slits, and you pick particular bands of light at a time and send those through the sample. So this is the monochrometer that we've got shown here. You, know, you have the, the incident beam, which has the light source over here, and then over here, either going to the detector or going through the sample and then to the detector. Or sometimes you have the light source over here and the sample over here, and then you disperse the beam of what came through the sample and hitting the detector. But this is the dispersive element. Now for infrared light, glass is going to absorb infrared. So if we wanted to use a prism, what would we have to make it out of? So what kind of substances are transparent to the infrared? Remember, infrared is absorbed by covalent bonds. So can you make a solid substance that doesn't have covalent bonds. Salt. Salt. Yeah, and so the windows that are transparent for infrared light are salts. And so you can have potassium bromide windows, you could make a potassium bromide prism. And so I've seen prisms that are this big, you know, I mean it's huge, that are made out of pure potassium bromide and they're clear as glass. It's beautiful. But you need to keep them in a desiccator because <laughs> salt dissolves in water. Okay, and so you have to make sure that that spectrometer stays dry because otherwise water will attack these windows and salt elements. Now we don't have a prism because it's susceptible to attack by water and it's a very humid environment. But we do have salt windows. We have potassium bromide windows in our spectrometer. So don't touch them, okay, because they're moist fingers will leave a big old moist fingerprint and then that will attract more water and it will just create a bad spot on that window. Um, will the color or wavelength of the light coming in hitting that prism change the wavelength coming out? Well, it's dispersed and so whatever light comes in is going to be spread out okay. when it comes out. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, I was wondering like, if you have a different wavelength, will the, will the like, dispersion be different or will the intensity be different? No, if you, whatever comes in will just come out in a different position. You know? okay. so, so if you have, like you could put your sample in front of your dispersing element, and it would just disperse the light that came out. But if that sample absorbed a particular wavelength, it will still be missing on the other side. Okay. So it really doesn't matter which side of the monochrometer you put your sample on. Yeah. You just need to have this, the sample and the monochrometer between your source and your detector, but they can be in any order. 
and there's advantages to, to each. Um, what's interesting here, though, is for, for high resolution, you need to thin the, the, the window, right? You need, to, you need to put a slit in there to only let wavelength 2 through and not 3 or 1. And so for higher resolution in a dispersive instrument, you have to narrow the slits. Well, what does that do to the detector? It makes it harder to see because there's less light hitting the detector. So for high resolution instruments, you have very little light. And so you need to sit there and, and you need to average longer. So you, you have to have the detector look for a very long time to make sure that the light signal is stable. But that also introduces noise. So the higher resolution spectrometers are, are really prone to noise. Because the detector, you turn the gain all the way up on that detector to detect very small levels of light. And any kind of scattering in your spectrometer, if your spectrometer is leaky, and so remember, we're trying to look at your sample. We want the inside of the spectrometer to be dark. And if there's a pinhole in there, then light coming through and illuminating and bouncing around inside there is going to hit the detector, and it's going to be, it's going to be wrong. You're going to get signals not related to your sample. Okay. So you need the inside of your spectrometers to be very dark. And for high resolution, you need very narrow slits, which creates a noisy spectrum. Now, if we wanted to... Uh, remove the slits and just do a scan immediately, not have to rotate this diffraction grating or the prism, we could replace the slits and the detector with a diode array. And so that's what's being shown up here. If we, if we take this, this piece out and we put in the diode array detector, then the diode array will be here. Now, what does that word mean? Diode is how we detect light, so these little semiconductor diodes. It's like a, you could think of it kind of like a, a little uh, photocell, so it gives a voltage when light hits it. And an array is just a bunch of these, and that's what's on our cameras. So camera technology has really helped spectroscopy because we've made megapixel displays, now we can make megapixel detectors. And so you just put an array in there, a single stripe, instead of a 2D image, you're just getting a 1D image, you're just getting a line. You put that in your spectrometer and you can have your whole spectrum collected at once. So you take the slit out, you take the motor off your diffraction grating, there are no moving parts. And so these are fantastic <clears throat> spectrometers. There's no moving parts to the spectrometer. Your light comes in, gets dispersed, and hits the detector, and you get a spectrum. And so these are now miniaturized, and later on when we get to visible spectroscopy, we'll use the USB spectrometer that we have, which is, looks about the size of a deck of cards. And it's the whole spectrometer. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. So this is a scanning instrument. Again, uh, it's, it's good since it's all fixed. You could, you could analyze a particular wavelength and sit there and do kinetics. So if you have a lambda max for a particular transition and you're doing a decomposition, you want to see that peak go away, uh, it's a very stable instrument. And you can sit on that lambda max and watch it decrease and do kinetics very well. So scanning instruments are really strong for, for kinetic experiments and time-based studies. Here's the interferometer. This is the Mickelson interferometer. <coughs> and this is the uh, sort of a block diagram of our uh, infrared spectrometer. We have the source here. It goes to this, this uh, Mickelson interferometer. So the light comes here and this is a 50% beam splitter. So half the light goes up and half of the light goes through. And you say, well, now how do they do that? Well, they just deposit a thin film of metal onto a salt window. And it's not completely covered or that would be a mirror. Okay? So they just put enough metal on there to give you a 50% transmission. So half the light goes through, half the light goes up. And then the light that goes through is hitting a moving mirror. So this moving mirror goes back and forth. And as it's going back and forth, it's sending the light back. So the light's bouncing off of this mirror and coming back to the beam splitter and recombining with the light that went up and down. And so uh, roughly 100% comes through. So these things are amazing. You know, 100% comes in, uh, roughly 100% comes out. But what comes out is an interference pattern. And that interference pattern goes through the sample and then hits the detector. 
Now this is a, a, like a single beam instrument, so we have to take the sample out and get a background scan. So we get a scan of that interferometer signal, the, interfer uh, the interferogram is what they call it. And then you put the sample in and you get a, another interferogram with the sample. And then you do the ratio and get transmittance. And then you can convert that to, uh, to absorbance. So it's a single beam instrument, but it's a, it's a very, very good one. But the nice thing about it is 100% of the light is hitting our detector. We're not dispersing it. And we don't need our detector to be an array. We can put all our money into one particular photodiode and we can have all the light hit. So you can definitely see a stable signal when it's much brighter than, than the surroundings. So this is a very low noise uh, arrangement. The detector has plenty of signals. So signal to noise is great in these instruments, these interferometer instruments. The other thing too is the resolution doesn't depend upon any slit width. So you don't have to decrease the light to get high resolution. All you have to do is move the mirror further. And so when I'm trying to determine the difference between uh, these waves, you know, they, they take two different paths. And then when they come back and recombine, they're either in phase or out of phase. And what would make them out of phase is the different path lengths that they take. Does everybody understand what's going on? They take different path lengths and when they recombine, they're either in phase, which would give you constructive interference, or out of phase, which would give you, you know, destructive interference. And so the wave would be destroyed and you have no light at that, that combined frequency coming through. And that's what the interferogram is. So how can I tell the difference between waves that are really close together? Well, I have to have one of them travel further. And so for high resolution, if I want to tell between two peaks that are very close together, I need a long path length. And so that's the equation for for resolution, 1 over 2 times the path length difference. And so if I have a 2 centimeter difference in my mirror movement, then that's a 0.25 wave number resolution, which is really handy, because 2 centimeters is not very far to move an object. In my research uh, that I did in graduate school, we got to use the, the uh, Bruker high resolution 120 instrument, and it had a 2 meter path length. So this, this mirror went, you know, it was two meters long, the path length, and so it was sitting on the carousel, and so the interferometer, this mirror would move all the way down for two meters and come back, and it had resolution of a thousandth of a wave number. So we were doing gas phase studies. So that's the, inter that's the interferometer. This is the me mechanics. This is the signal. So this is the interferogram. We try to use the highlighters. So the interferogram is this, this dark line right here. Okay, so it goes down and up. And it comes back to zero and then down again. And now it's at a maximum again. And then it's at a minimum and it goes back to zero. And then it's a minimum, a maximum, back to zero. So you see, it's, um, it's this interference pattern of these waves interfering with each other as I move the mirror. And so this is the mirror displacement in centimeters. So that, that movable mirror is moving back and forth and producing this interference pattern. Now what's happening, this is the interference pattern of just two frequencies. So I've got two frequencies going into the interferometer and those two frequencies would produce this interference pattern. So cosine one is in blue and cosine two is in red. So the question is, can you come up with the x-axis here on the, on the spectrum from that interferogram? So let's do this for just two cosines. And then you could maybe imagine what it does when you have you know, a billion in the spectrometer. Okay, but this is what's going on with the fast Fourier transform. The Fourier transform inverts the x-axis. So write that down. The, the Fourier transform inverts the units on the x-axis. The Fourier transform inverts the units on the x-axis. And so if our mirror displacement is in centimeters, what's the inverse of centimeters? Wave numbers. Okay, so we have a wave that has a certain wavelength in centimeters, and if I invert that, I have then the number of waves per centimeter, which is frequency, which is the spectrum that I want to see. 
I want to see a peak for each cosine. So since I have two cosines that are interfering with each other in distance, when I convert that to inverse distance, I get the frequency for cosine 1 and the frequency for cosine 2 in wave numbers. So let's look at this. If I were able to see those cosines, let's look at the red one. And so the red one, I'll go this way. So the red one here goes down and up. So that's a full wave. And so what is the, the distance it took to go one full wave? One centimeter. So that's one wave per centimeter. Okay, so that down here would be, let's change my pen. So that was the red one. So let's go with a red pen. So that would be a one right here. So that peak is the red cosine peak. So when we did the, the Fourier transform for this interferogram, we got one peak that corresponds to that red cosine. Let's do the blue one. So now the blue peak starts here at zero displacement. So here the path lengths are the same. And so you said this center burst. When the path lengths are the same, all wavelengths travel the same path. And when they come back, they constructively interfere and build each other back up. And so you have this center burst. But as soon as those, that mirror displacement starts to become a different path length in the interferometer, then you start to have some interference, some, de some destructive interference and then some constructive interference. And so you have this oscillating pattern that, that arrives on either side of that center burst. So let's look at the blue, blue peak. So it's going down here, and it's coming back up, and it gets back to its maximum at two centimeters. So what is the, the waves per centimeter value? Yeah, so how many waves per centimeter? A half a wave per centimeter because it has to go down and back up in two centimeters so this is 0.5 so it's it's half a wave per centimeter that's what wave numbers is it's how many waves per centimeter that you have and so this would be a 0.5 and so that would be the blue peak And so this interferogram is telling you all of the interference of all of the frequencies that come out of the source. And so it's sort of a picture of, the, the, of all, the, all the cosines coming out of the source. And then when you take a Fourier transform of it, you get the frequency spectrum of the source. And if we look at that in the lab, you see just this, this sort of black body looking curve. You see all of the frequencies available from the source. And then we put the sample in the beam, and some of those frequencies are missing, right? Because the sample absorbs some of those frequencies. So the interferogram looks slightly different. And when we do the, do the fast Fourier transform, we get a black body shape of a curve, but with some missing frequencies. So you see these, di these dips. And when you take I over I naught, then you get transmittance values, and then when you convert that to absorbance, you get absorbance values. And so you see these peaks wherever there was missing light. And so it's pretty straightforward, but it's a very sensitive technique. It's, it's bright because you don't have slits, and it's high resolution because all you have to do is move the mirror a few centimeters, and you've got decent resolution. And it's very fast, too. So this moving that mirror takes a few seconds, and so we can do 32, 40 scans in about 30 seconds. And so you'll, you know, we'll put the sample on there and scan 32 times and build that spectrum up, uh, and, and it'll take a half a minute. Whereas if we were going to scan like this monochromator uh, to get that same spectrum, it might take five, ten minutes. So it's much slower in a dispersive instrument. So here's a here's sort of a block diagram or a look under the hood inside of our spectrometer. We have the source. And then we have the interferometer there. So the source, this is that Nernst glower. 
and then the interferometer with the 50% beam splitter. We have some, always have some mirrors inside to get the beam where we want. And then this is the sample chamber, but we're using this attenuated total reflectance attachment. So the light comes and hits this mirror, comes into a diamond crystal, it bounces off the inner surface of that crystal, and comes back down and is lined back up with the detector. So we actually have a diamond in our instrument. Okay, nobody steal it, because it's not like a gemstone. <laughs> It'd be a really weird cut. It's a nice flat surface and some angles on the bottom. Okay, but who knows? Two science geeks. That'd be great, actually, to find an old instrument with a diamond ATR and put that in as an engagement ring if you were a super geek. Yeah, yeah, that'd, be, that'd be sweet, you know. And it'd be optically clear, so it'd be beautiful. Probably wouldn't sparkle very much, you know, because it doesn't have all the facets. But you would know it was an ATR diamond. <laughs> you know, no one else would have one of those. <laughs> so that may be the that may be the, the attraction of it. It's like I've got a unique engagement ring. You know. uh, I did not do that for my wife because she's an accountant. And wouldn't quite appreciate it. <laughs> so, but you know, uh, yeah. So, so let's look at the details of this ATR. We got some time to, to dig into that. And so here's let's let's just take this this little region here and look at what's going on. So we have the the diamond crystal here. And the lights coming in and oscillating and it's hitting the surface and bouncing off. <coughs> so 100% of that light is, is bouncing off the inside surface of the diamond. That's why it's called total reflectance, right? ATR is attenuated total reflectance. So let's, that's just the total reflectance part. It's not really going through your sample. Okay, it's kind of interesting because you, normally your sample, the light goes through your sample. But this case is not going through your sample. It is interacting with it. So at this surface, it's kind of like a drum head. And that surface oscillates. Let me get a different pen color. So this surface is oscillating like, like a drum head or a trampoline. And your sample is on top of that. Or not. If you're doing a background, there's no sample, but if, if, you, if you have a sample pressed onto the surface, then it's going to feel that oscillation. That might be a bad color. So you have your sample pressed onto that surface, and this trampoline surface is vibrating with the light. And that's, is it, the atoms aren't vibrating, but the electron cloud is, okay? And, and just that surface where that, that light is reflecting is, is oscillating, and that's called the evanescent wave. So that was one of the vocabulary words uh, for your homework was the evanescent wave. So... I'll try to spell it. E V A N E S. Let's see. Where is it? E S C E N T. Yeah. And if that evanescent wave happens to match like a CH stretch, then it can resonate with that CH stretch. And energy is conserved. So if that CH stretch gets excited and goes up in its vibrational energy, the evanescent wave goes down in its intensity. Okay, so it's lost some of its, of its character. Okay, it's attenuated. And that's the A. So attenuated total reflectance. So this evanescent wave can be attenuated by the vibrational frequencies in your sample. And when it comes out the other end, it's missing some of those frequencies. And so when we take the sample and, subtr and subtract the, or divide by the source, you know, the I versus I naught, then we have some missing frequencies. So this the total reflectance that's attenuated is how the ATR works. Now it's frequency dependent. And so that's one of the problems with ATR is if you have the spectrum, so...
let's say 400 is over here and 4,000 is over here. The depth of this effect looks like this. I'll, I'll say depth, okay. Or another way to say it is path length. in the sample. Even though that's a little confusing because it's not actually going into the sample, but it's interacting with the sample. And so down here at 400 wave numbers, it might be two microns, two microns, and then over here it might be 0.2 microns. And we know from Beer's law that the absorbance is dependent upon path length, right? And so I've got a two micron path length at one part of my spectrum and a hundred times smaller path length at a different part of my spectrum. So that's a problem, right? Or ten times smaller. And so our, our spectrum, the low frequency peaks are really tall and the CH stretch peaks are really small. And so then this path length function is known and so then the software can correct for it and essentially make the low frequency peaks smaller and the CH stretch peaks higher. So the ATR correction is something that we will use to make the spectrum look more like a straight absorbance spectrum. So would like the top of the diamond be like opaque in the sense that like it won't let any light go through it? Or like but this is in the infrared so in the visible light would go right through. Oh, okay. Yeah, so this is the infrared light that's interacting with it. Okay. Yeah. Now there will be an angle that you could get it internal reflection with visible light as well. And so you can see that certain angles, you know, a, a smooth surface will reflect almost 100% of what hits it. You know, and, and so at a slightly different angle, it won't reflect that much. It's called the Brewster angle. So if you can find a Brewster angle with a certain polarization, you can reflect 100% of the incident light. But it's polarization dependent and angle dependent. All right. Let's, we've got three minutes. We might be able to do that Kahoot. Okay, so.